Hello everyone, it's Shane Kanto, your Wasteland reviewer, and welcome to Welcome to the Wasteland, my weekly show where I take a deep dive into a particular film, and we're just in the year of 2020 forward. Um, we're in the 1950s, more specifically, it's still a 1950, as we're going through John Ford's films, and we'll be tackling the Western, and joining me is one of my best friends, and one of my favorite friends to talk movies with, Haley, thank you so much for coming on. You're welcome. This was a uh, definitely out of my lane, so it's going to be an interesting conversation. <laughs> it will be an interesting conversation, as I watch a lot of westerns and it'll be interesting to talk about this before we get there we have three segments so we have our coming attractions for friday august 2nd yikes i don't like it that's august um and then we'll be getting into our feature of the week which is rio grande and we'll be getting to some recommendations for everybody at the end of the show. So let's get things started with some of our coming attractions. It's a decent amount of things coming out in limited release, on streaming, and in theaters. We actually have three wide releases coming out in theaters this weekend. Harold and the Purple Crayon, one of the weirdest uh, decisions for a movie to come out. Um, and why they make this classic story, he's an adult now. Um, we have Kneecap, which seems like it could be an interesting biopic that's kind of flying under the radar. No bunch of stuff on streaming, including a new quote unquote SpongeBob movie. It's called the Sandy Cheeks movie. Spoiler alert, it's just as much SpongeBob it is as Sandy. So, of course, it's still a SpongeBob movie. We're both excited for M. Night Shyamalan's Trap. So, Haley, what interests you and makes you excited about Trap? Honestly, it's not even so much the exact premise as the <laughs> fact that I will always stubbornly still watch M. Night Shyamalan movies. Like, I I refuse to fully let him go. Um, mm -hmm. And I've seen, like, I normally don't go to the theater to see the movies anymore, but I still generally go to see the things that he comes up with. Um, this one definitely feels like it's playing into some of his old strengths, like the suspense, but like on a bigger scale like he's done some more like personal small things that like you know whether or not you're into it is your decision but i kind of like the this like big you know crafty like psychological thing that's going on um i think it has an opportunity to be good we'll we'll see we shall see and it's interesting because this is a confined story to one location it just happens that the one location's an arena, because this is taking place during a pop concert, uh, which the pop star who's in the movie is M. Night Shyamalan's one daughter. So she's a... Oh, she's I didn't realize a, that. She's a musician. Uh, so oh. And his other daughter's a director. So there you go. Um, and he gets both of them work. Uh, excited because Josh Hartnett who used was he was like the next hot thing in the early 2000s with like Pearl Harbor and stuff like that and then his career just completely went off the rails and then Penny Dreadful kind of revived his career a little bit and most recently he popped up with a pretty a pretty sizable supporting performance in Oppenheimer as the other scientist doing the actual physical testing and stuff like that down the hall so i'm excited to see him in this and see what they have up uh shaman has up his sleeve for him and just this seems like it's going to be an intense suspenseful ride and that's all you really want from a Shyamalan movie which also shout out is the 20th anniversary of the village Oh, see, and I am a fan of The Village. I feel like mm -hmm. that's a divisive one. I am in camp. I thought that was a great movie. I feel like originally people were pissed off because they didn't like the reveal of what was actually going on. I feel like that's a film that has gained more love over time, where you're more removed from the fact that people were pissed off about what it turned out to actually be. Because, like... I'm not going to spoil the movie because if you haven't watched it, 
but don't watch the trailers. The trailers kind of set you up for something specifically, and it turns out to not be that. But I think it's a really great... Like, honestly, his first four films were either like ranging from really good movies to masterpieces. So like that's really impressive. And then, you know, with Lady in the Water and post that kind of spiraled into uh, atrocities like The Last Airbender and After Earth. Uh, so they exist. But with the villain, since um uh the visit things kind of were getting back on track. And honestly, I'm so excited to watch Shyamalan. Huge Shyamalan fan. Like, I really love The Sixth Sense, Unbreakable, and Signs. They're some of my favorite movies. They are so, some of the best movies. <laughs> like, they're incredible they are. Films. So, like, there's a reason people thought he was going to be the next, next Hitchcock. He has that kind of talent. It's just a matter of we'll see. It's basically film to film for me. I don't get like, I don't go into like, oh, he's done. No, like, he could throw out a really good movie and then come out with something that just didn't really work for me. So we'll see if Trap, where that lands. So, definitely some Fingers options crossed. for this weekend for you to go check out. We're going to jump into our actual John Ford film, which is Rio Grande, Rio Grande, however you prefer to say it. However, um, John Wayne decided to say it because I was just like, oh, we're saying Rio Grande. Okay. All right. Sure. <laughs> we're we're going to go over the Rio Grande. Huh? That's swagger and John Wayne. So, synopsis a cavalry officer posted on the Rio Grande is confronted with murderous raiding Apaches, a son whose risk taking recruit and his wife from whom he has been separated for many years. Many years means 15 years! Like, he's been away from home 15 years! So, like, are they even still married? Like, I was very confused for a large portion about what was going on there. I think they mostly, like, clarified. I think I understood by the end, but I was... I was a little, little confused for a minute. When, when you are away from your husband for 15 years, like, that's a long time. Child, who's now an adult, almost an adult, and now in the military. But here's some background on the film. So this is starring John Wayne and Maureen O'Hara, who each together has starred in, I think it is... Uh, three or four films for John Ford they starred in, and seven films total mm -hmm. as lead actor and actress. So they obviously had a lot of experience with each other. This is the final entry in the unofficial Cavalry trilogy that John Wayne had directed, three films focusing on Cavalry. Uh, Ford wanted to make A Quiet Man as his next film. Mm -hmm. He did not want to do another Western. And the studio was like, man, a uh, quiet man's not going to make any money. You're going to make another Western so we can make money first. And then you can go make this other movie. Um, spoiler alert, quiet man made a significant more money than Rio Grande. So uh, the studio was incorrect, but both of them wound up making the studio money. So I'm sure the studio was happy. Um, which a quiet man is a much more like romantic drama set in Ireland because John Ford two things that John Ford loves westerns and the Irish because like his parents are Irish immigrants so there's definitely a lot of influence there but this is based on a mission with no record and newspaper story so he found this story and wound up adapting it. It was loosely based on the 4th Cavalry Regiment in 1873 Mexico. So this is loosely based on an actual uh, regiment. The screenwriter died four weeks after the film's release, which is very sad. Um, this is shot in Moab, Utah. So not Monument Valley. This is back-to-back -back films that John Ford shot in Utah. The other one made sense. It was about the Mormons uh, going across 
the West and trying to settle in Utah. Uh, there was extreme heat in Utah when they were shooting this film that caused all kinds of issues trying to shoot the film. Like John Wayne was like dying, sweating uh, for a lot of this shoot. And the soundtrack features folk songs from Sons of the Pioneers. So the group of guys that just go around singing. Um, that which just keep singing? <laughs> which, uh, it got kind of fixed from Italy. I was watching it specifically about the singing. So, there you go. Um, also, this is starring some Don Ford regulars like Ben Johnson, who played Travis Tyree. He's the one that they are like, You're, we're taking you in uh, for manslaughter. Uh, he would go on to win an Oscar for Last Picture Show. And Harry Carey Jr., who is Sandy, because he's a ginger. And of course, they keep naming him Sandy in John Ford movies. Um, also, Victor McLaughlin, who used to be a lead in John Ford films. And now he is a sassy Irish character actor. That keeps popping up in his movies for comic relief. But, Haley, what are your general thoughts on the film? Oh, man. I mean, well, first and foremost, this was a 50s movie. And I just had to keep telling myself, this is a 50s movie. Like, mm. it's a 50s movie. It's a movie of its time. And wow, was it a movie of its time? Because, I mean, Shane has helped me to broaden my horizons in many ways. But I generally do not, like go like that early and to be honest this is a good reminder of (laughs) of why um i there were things about it that i respected um Mm -hmm. but then there's like i mean we'll probably get into this but like deeply problematic things that are very hard to watch and then (laughs) also like not a lot happens and the things that do happen are kind of confusing. <laughs> um, like, so okay. Let me let me just start off. Let me start off by saying there's a couple things that I thought were really good that I really appreciated okay. about it. So we'll start with that. First of all, I think the actors that have not been mentioned that need to be mentioned are the horses. There are a lot of really good horses in this movie they're beautiful they do exactly what they're supposed to do which is very impressive like there's some like horse tricks that happen Mm -hmm. that i honestly was very impressed by because you know those were practical effects like no one like yeah people were literally riding horses one foot on each horse multiple times and also trying to jump over yeah uh, like which the sun when he falls off and lands on his feet on that stunt there's incredible stunt work in this film and the horse stunt work is really impressive in particular so i definitely see where you're coming from with that yeah and even like when people would get like shot off their horse like i would there's not i'm like did someone die like that's insane (laughs) yeah like how do you you're taking your life into your hands. And I get they're just extras. Like, it's not like the main star ever gets Mm -hmm. in that situation, but I'm just like, that is uh, intense. Um, (laughs) Some people. So I'm sure that people got mangled in some of those movies somewhere down Mm -hmm. the line. So, like, rest in peace. But um, anyway, so I really respected those things. Mm -hmm. I also... As much as I like roll my eyes, the whole like the the drama, you know, like the the drama of especially with the lady at like I rolled my eyes a lot, but there is also it's like that's the classic. There's this tension between the two mm. of them, and I mean, I think that I would have appreciated it more if I wasn't very sad for this man who clearly like is just like a man in the fifties and can't ex- well, he's a man in the eighteen whatever the yes. heck. He cannot express himself. He has no way of, like, sharing his feelings with anybody for... Which is very upsetting. Mm -hmm. Like, his son, he's, like, looking at him, like, getting into brawls and stuff, and you can tell he's like, oh, it's my baby, and I kind of care, but I can't. I just have to pretend I'm tough. Well, Um, well, and that's the tricky thing with, like, the military aspect. 
Because, like, you have to put away all those personal feelings in the line of duty. And he's a lieutenant colonel. Uh, Kirby York. What a name um, John Wayne has in this movie. But, like, that's the thing. Like, there's moments where, you're right, when he sees his son brawling. And he, like, runs up a little bit and, like, has to stop himself. Because, like, as a father, you want to go in there and protect your son. But as a lieutenant colonel, you got to let your men, you know, deal with their shit. And then there's definitely a lot of moments like that. And that's one of the most interesting dramatic pieces of this is trying to balance duty and balance the love for your family. But yeah, the love for your family part is also very ambiguous because obviously, like, you can tell he cares and he's, like, struggling and, and isn't not, he's just not doing a good job of, like, saying what he needs to say mm -hmm. and whatever. Um, but then there was clearly an event that they keep referencing. And they never, like, they do kind of explain it, but I'm also, like, not 100%, like, clear because i guess it's that they had to like scorch a bunch of things maybe to make them uninhabitable for the other to the, the soldiers who were coming or whatever and you know it really made his wife mad <laughs> but i'm like this is very steeped in a history that yeah i'm not familiar with if we're being honest well, and i think the challenge too is like thinking about if you're getting sent out by the military out into the west to the frontier like who's to say you're gonna come back anytime soon like you're out in the middle of nowhere and do i expect like these campaigns last 15 years that he doesn't come back home and like obviously his kid was a baby or an infant when he left because like his son's not even legally allowed to be in the military so he's not 18 and so, like, right. if he's gone 15 years, he was a baby at that point. And it's just, like, that, obviously, this film's coming in at a very specific moment of son shows up. And we have that moment where he hears York. Mm -hmm. And he's like, what? And, like, he goes out and finds his son there. And then, of course, mom shows up because mom's like, over my dead, <laughs> you're going into this military. And comes for them. And then it really does become... Obviously, you have that family drama um, between the three of them. But also, there's a lot of layered drama going on between the other characters. Because, like, uh, Maureen O'Hara's Kathleen isn't just there to just be his wife or just be a mother. She grows connection and fondness to some of the other soldiers. Like uh, Tyree, the one that they keep trying to arrest because of uh manslaughter that apparently that happened and obviously that's another mystery until he finally explains like what happened um but there's that's the thing a lot of these characters have some real like like baggage from their past that they're bringing into this situation yeah i gotta be honest the the thing with the tyree guy really threw me because even when he kind of explained the situation i'm like but what you're saying is that you still killed somebody well, and to you be did fair, kill somebody. They're and in the then, military. And then, they're they're but, hired to kill people. But then so. the lady is all like, "Oh, but he's such a nice boy," and I'm like, "He killed somebody." Like, okay, he's got a charming smile or something, and then he's just like keeps stealing everyone's horses, and they're like, "Oh, oh, oh, oh that's that's just our buddy," and I'm just what's going on. Like, like, well, you have a good eye for horses, because he. Takes John Wayne's horse exactly. specifically. Um, I, and I think that's definitely something of the time because, like, yeah, in the 1800s, like, it was a lot of stuff time. happened on the frontier. And, like, unless you were like specifically doing it, like, it sounds like his thing was like trying to protect something mm -hmm. or getting in the wrong place at the wrong time and like mm -hmm. dangerous place. And obviously, they did find it uh, something worth trying to find him for because they were trying to arrest him. And then, obviously, he proved himself to the rest of his regiment to the point where at the very end of the movie, 
they show up at that big ceremony to arrest him. And he's like, <laughs> it's like Trooper Tyree's going on leave. And he just hops on his horse and get the hell out of there. Yeah. It was like, goofy. There, well, and there's definitely some comic relief moments in this film too, and a lot of them have to do with Victor McLaughlin's character, the mm-hmm. like middle aged Irish man, uh, which you definitely know. Uh, there's definitely it's a theme. Like, obviously, I've watched a lot of John Ford films at this point, and there's like very similar players that keep popping up in his movies, and Victor McLaughlin's like. I need comic relief. Slip him in. Because he's middle-aged, he'll make jokes about drinking, and he's Irish. I was just going to say, the sloppy Irishman who has, like, holes in his pants and just just keeps sneaking a drink. And I'm just like, well, at least you're being, like, racist on all sides. I mean, you're equal opportunity. There's something to be said about that. And I guess in terms of that, well, John Ford's Irish, so he's like, well, I know Irish people. And yeah. Like, there you go. Um, but I guess, were there any other things that stood out to you as positives about the film? Um, I, I think that, well, I also appreciated, on some level, it felt like they were really trying to and and maybe I just feel this way because I'm not I don't watch a lot of westerns maybe this is a very common trope but they really I think there were some select scenes that I think were kind of informative like from a historical perspective like that this idea that you know these people come back um and and mind you a number of them had their families on this base situation and yes it was dangerous yeah. and you you see that and that's like not that's something you could have skimmed over but they chose to like highlight it and then mm-hmm. also that you know this very tense thing where the 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 troops are coming back and the women are lined up and they're basically looking for their guy like mm-hmm. is he here <laughs> um well, and that was it's very powerful. sad to yeah. think about um and that's a great shot too cuz like that's the thing John Ford was an incredible filmmaker and mm-hmm. when you're watching one of his films and like that law, like there's so much depth to that shot of that long line of soldiers mm-hmm. coming back. And especially at the end, after this raid of his town to get the kids back and everything, it's like, we know John Wayne's yeah. not in a good place. And then it's a matter of when more uh Maureen O'Hara sees him and what shape he's in and he doesn't look good um by the time he gets back and basically he seems to be okay. He made it. Yeah. He made it out okay. Because like I think John Wayne's died on screen like five times in his whole Yeah I didn't know career. if they were gonna do it. Like I was kind of like you know when when obviously you know the this poor you know, like the Indian is like drawing his bow, and you're like, "Are they gonna do it? Are they gonna do it?" And I mean, it almost would have been better if they had on some level because they couldn't hit anything. Which again, I mean, if we want, want we'll... it was stormtrooper level, like, and also the people who fell off the horse. I'm sorry, but they're like getting shot off the horse, and then they just get up. And I'm like, why did you get up? No selling. Off the horse? Like, it's oh, this in terms of some of the things that really stood out to me about the film. I think the ensemble's really strong, and that's one mm-hmm. thing that I've certainly noticed about John Ford films. It's like he knows how to put a cast together, and like I appreciate some of these films where you see a little bit more nuance to John Wayne's persona, where it's like mm-hmm. there's a little bit more vulnerability here. Instead of he's just swaggering around. Um, because there's certainly movies where you see that. That's why The Searchers is my favorite. Like he is a complicated, not good man in The Searchers. And it's certainly one of his best performances. I'm really looking forward to that one. I'll get around to that at I believe the end of September. <laughs> Making my way to that. Um, mm-hmm. I think Maureen O'Hara 
I think is a very charismatic performer. I think she does well with what she's given. It's not like she's given a ton to do, no. except for being a worried wife, worried mother. But um, I'm a big fan of Ben Johnson. I think he adds a lot to John Ford's films. And like in this smaller role, um, love Harry Carey Jr. But I think he does a fine job. Um, I appreciated the, the friendship kind of developing between young Trooper York, Tyree, and Sandy. Because, like, mm-hmm. obviously they build a connection because Tyree picks the two of them to go on this raid, which also another moment where John Wayne's like, it's like, you want to take my son into this? Yeah. Um, but he can't say that. Can't say that at all. Um, because he has to stick by his duty. And I like their dynamic. This is not the most nuanced depiction of Native Americans in John Ford's films. It's also not the worst because there's. I was afraid really that it wasn't the because it's well, pretty bad. <laughs> it's. I think that some of the saving graces, at least the film shows some of their culture. Um, I think, like, obviously they're very mean to the Native American, the Apache that they have in their camp when they're, like, getting angry about them singing and stuff like that. Obviously, they it didn't work out for the cavalry because then it alluded, it kind of told them exactly where they were. And then they got raided. Um, so obviously they were not going to be happy about that. I, it's interesting because pre-World War II, a lot of John Ford's films were not very nuanced in terms of Native Americans. And also quite a few of them were very, uh, Confederate sympathy films. I was going to also Which go there as there like, that's probably the other thing that I was like, oof. Of that here. And I think like... I am sure this hit different in 1950 when they played this at the end, which upsets me that it probably played differently. But when they played Dixie at the end, I'm just like, this is supposed to be like about the U.S. military and you're playing Confederate music. Yay! Well, and, you know, he gives her that $10 bill that's like defunct currency because it was from a different it was for confederate currency and i didn't know how she'd react nation. yeah i didn't know how she'd react and then she's like kiss me and i'm like oh god okay so all right <laughs> well, obviously at some point they lived in the confederacy so um but i didn't I know if that whole like i didn't know what side he was on and i don't i didn't know like where they lived and and he when they were a... burning stuff down like was that the you know the pillaging through like or you know like i didn't know well and i think that's and he could have kept it ambiguous but he made a call <laughs> it's and that's a challenging thing too because like not confronting that in some way because like if you think 1870s, like, unless you're 20, or, like, well, unless you're 10 or Tiny less, baby, yeah. like, right. you experienced Civil War. <laughs> like, this is not that far off from when this was, was happening. And even, like, John Wayne's most famous character from John Ford films in The Searchers, Ethan Edwards was a Confederate soldier who mm-hmm. didn't surrender mm. and was like solving all pro- kinds of problems for the union and then shows up. He's not a good man. Ethan Edwards character mm-hmm. uh, as a character in the searchers. It's very, he's a very interesting character, but no, this, when that happened where they started throwing a couple of tinges of like Confederate pride and stuff. I'm like, yeah, which I guess if you think about it this way, this film came out 90 years after the start of the Civil War. This film is 74 years old. We're uh, This film's almost closer to the Civil War than we are. Which yeah. is 
really weird to think about. I've had a lot of those moments talking about some of these films because especially in the 30s, they were closer to the Civil War than today. Um, yeah. In terms of, it's this is a really well shot film. He always finds really great settings to take advantage of in terms of like out west, which is why he's so well known for like Monument Valley and stuff like that. I think there's certainly thrilling moments. There's exhilarating action sequences, which I think you brought up with like the stunt work and stuff like that. I I appreciate the added layers of the human drama because not a lot of westerns like go that deep into it. And I think there's some enjoyable supporting characters in this. And um it did get a little silly towards the end of especially when they go to like the rescue mission, the go for broke rescue mission, and that little girl's basically screaming everything. I know. When they come yeah. In. And I do appreciate that Sandy made a joke because she on our arms in her thirst. Yeah, I was, was I was like, at least she's saying it because we're all thinking it. We're all thinking it. <laughs> um, I guess are there any other particular things that stood out to you that you wanted to talk about specifically about the film? Um, well, yeah, I'd wanted to kind of reckon a little bit with the fact that I think they made certain decisions, you know, with how certain people from certain things are portrayed. And so like, whenever you get into like vet veterans, you know, like mm -hmm. I appreciate when there's, added depth to like look these people went through a certain thing mm -hmm. and and so then of course like john wayne's character and the supporting character like the comedic relief guy like they had this mm -hmm. relationship and they do build that i definitely think there's like for a movie of its time granted i haven't seen that many of them but mm -hmm. i i do think that there was more like attempted here than probably a lot of things. When I think of a Western, I normally think of more of like just a, everyone shooting at each other. Um, and there was def definitely more like like drama than I was expecting. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say the things that made it like hard for me were obviously, you know, it's just it's just hard to know that like, okay, they're here and their whole thing, the whole plot is just, based on the fact that they are at war with like these people who have literally just lived here and they're yep. like and they're the heroes when in reality it's like you're just like you're just making these people's lives really hard and i know that like we all benefit from the fact that the history happened that way of course of course but I don't know. It's still hard to watch and it's hard to like buy into it. Um, but you know, like it's, it is history. It is a thing of its time. And I did try to sort of like see it as a cultural artifact. Um, but the only other thing that honestly, like it just got to me and Shane, uh, Shane already knows this. <laughs> just, it's just too much singing. <laughs> like there's like the second time they like awkwardly serenaded this woman i'm like why are they doing this to her <laughs> like <laughs> leave her alone like she's just here like she has a Haley, mission and no one's like gift. acknowledging her <laughs> like her husband was trying to give her a nice gift of a bunch of random cowboys serenading her what he How could have you done understand? Was look her in the eyes and talk to him, talk to her about his feelings, and I don't know, maybe offer her a place there, living together, yeah, don't so that they that. could have been together. You know, there's just, yeah, and no, I get what you're saying, I do, but if we're being honest, I, the being second honest, time they started so. singing, I was like, holy crap, I don't know how many times are they gonna do this. The, the oh, past God. Couple of his films that I've watched have honestly had a lot of music and singing in them. Um, not quite like full blown, like actual group of characters in there singing in context of the movie, but obviously it's a taste kind of thing. But I liked the music, I thought the music was good, you know, it just this movie's very old fashioned. And how do you how do you try to get your wife to forgive you? Have some guys serenade her with some nice old timey 
uh, West country Western music. For sure. Well, and I will also say both John Wayne and you said her name was Maureen. Maureen O'Hara. Yep. Maureen. I mean, they're attractive people. Like, I've definitely seen like classical actors where I'm like, I, I don't get it. But mm-hmm. the two of them were like good looking people and like good looking in their like context. Like they both like mm-hmm. looked like they belonged in that era and they both were definitely like had that like antique attractiveness going on. And and I, I like I got it. I understood it, you know. John Wayne had that uh nice mustache and soul mm-hmm. patch combo. That he mm-hmm. was, uh, he was rocking there. For him, um, it was the eyes, though. His soulful, he's got a soulful face that mm-hmm. you know. He, it looks like he's seen some stuff, and and there's something it, like it wasn't the super wide suspenders that. that got you. <laughs> um, I mean, okay, Shane knows this, but I had just seen Deadpool, so like, uh, <laughs> you know, if, like a, a day beforehand, and so I got to see some people in feek. The, like peak physical condition, and so I'm sorry, but John Wayne can't actually hold. Um, a candle are too. you alluding to the climactic hand holding shopless? Yes. <laughs> All I'm gonna say is Hugh Jackman has aged to like fine wine, yeah, and I will no. always say that. But I think, uh, <laughs> but to your point, like, John Wayne has a very great look to him in this film. Mm-hmm. Um, very much. In all these cavalry films, like, he's he has that specific look, except one of them he plays older, so, like, they grade him up mm. and stuff like that, which was interesting. But no, Maureen O'Hare is, like, a very attractive, charismatic woman, and she obviously had a very successful career. She, oh, wow, he lived until she was 95. She was Dang. born in 1920 and she died in 2015. Wow. Which is also That's crazy. Good for her. 10 years ago. Oh, well, yeah. Having that. But imagine, like, she lived long enough to really, like, look back and see. To see her movies probably in the way that, like, we would see them, you know, which is kind of crazy. Like, these black and white films where everything was practical, there was literally no special effects, and, like, all it was yeah. such a different world. And then 2015, I mean, she probably could have seen, like, friggin' Endgame or whatever. <laughs> I'm 100% sure that's what she was, she, she was, uh, uh what... Endgame came out in 2019. What would have 2014? Oh, was it? Oh. Okay, fine. Then Civil War or something. She literally acted. Not to keep bursting your bubble, that came out in 2016. Oh. Gosh darn it. (laughs) Just missed it. She acted in like 2000. So she had. It looks like these are like. These look like some cheap. uh, Some cheap TV stuff. But no, she was in Big Jake back in 71. It looked like she mostly stopped acting by the end of the 60s. Mm. But she was in like McClintock and Big Jake, um, The Parent Trap, um, How oh. Green Was My Valley, the original Miracle on 34th Street. Um, she's like one of the main characters in that. Mm-hmm. Um, really talented actress. Obviously, John Wayne had a very illustrious career, especially working with John Ford, but I uh the only thing missing for this, and those who have been listening to all these episodes will get my reference here. There is no Ward Bond sighting. Uh he's like the most consistent character actor to pop up in John Ford movies. And he happened to not be in this one, which I was a little sad. Uh him and Victor Mc, uh, McLaughlin are like the two most consistent character actors that keep popping up in all these movies. So I keep a tally. I'm like, mm. it's a Ward Bond sighting. So, <laughs> n- no sighting on this one, people. I know, Darn. we're all disappointed. But I guess, Haley, do you have any other final thoughts that you wanted to throw out there about Rio Grande? Well, I think that, you know, if you want an experience and you want to really, like, put yourself in in a time 
like for good and for bad you know mm. these movies are intriguing i don't think i will go and watch every single one of them like shane has done um but there i have respect i do there's like as cringe as it is i knew like that it would feel that way like that's like it's it's easy to just sort of be like wow well, you know but yes there's there are things to be appreciated there and um like cinematically and stuff i mean it is crazy like on the one hand it's crazy how long ago it was but it's also crazy how not long ago that was it's like it was not long ago we have come so far it's Technology crazy. is advanced where people don't have to throw themselves off of horses to make a stunt work. Thank goodness. Thank but those goodness. horses, man, I hope they got some quality oats for their time. Oh, they need an equestrian Oscar. What are they even mm -hmm. doing? I what know. are they doing? No. They should have got one of the special, special Oscars. But we have some recommendations to send you all home with. Now, Haley, what would you like to recommend to everybody? Well, um, I know we talked about Deadpool, and I'm sure Shane will talk about Deadpool. Yes. Um, <laughs> so I'll let Shane talk about Deadpool, because that's what friends do. Um, but I saw, um, in addition to Deadpool, uh, the other, like a week or two ago, I went to see Long Legs with a friend of mine who is like a big Nicolas Cage fan. Um, I am tempted usually on Nick Cage because he's a weird man and sometimes I'm like into it and sometimes I'm not but I think he it had to have been him this movie could not have been like it, it no one else I don't think could have done that I mean other people could have done it but it wouldn't have been what it was um and I think he reached a level of unhingedness that I did not even think was possible um but it was actually pretty like it was it was an interesting unique film mm -hmm. like i found it to be a unique experience which typically when i go to like a scary movie in the theater my hope is that i will leave thinking huh i have never seen anything like that before <laughs> which is rare you know but it's it's a good experience cuz like canned scary stuff gets old um this was different and it was like pretty creepy um, and it wasn't cheap thrill stuff. Like they definitely like tried to forge new ground. Um, and I enjoyed the movie. I think that yep. it's worth watching. Um, and if you are a Nick Cage fan, you will probably bask in the glory of his absolute insanity. So I sure did <laughs> Haley. Thank you for noticing. <laughs> yeah. Um, I am one of those people that will watch anything with Nick Cage. Well, to be fair, I'd watch anything. Um, period, movie wise. Um, but I get I, <laughs> I get excited to watch Nick Cage in anything because you never know what kind of unhinged performance he's gonna deliver. And oh, long legs is something special. Legitimately the final shot of the movie is one of the most unhinged craziest things I think to end a movie on and if you love Nick Cage and oddly if you love the band T-Rex there's plenty of both of that in this movie because like all the actual songs that play in the movie are from the band T-Rex and I'm just like this is so weird um, listen but it's Nick Cage so then it just suddenly like that explains everything <laughs> Oh, but it works. And Micah Monroe is incredible. Between um, the guest and It Follows and what's the Watcher, I think it is. Mm. Another thriller that she was in. It, she just is killing it in these lead roles in these kinds of films. And it had a vibe. Osgood Perkins, son of <laughs> legendary actor Anthony Perkins, Norman Bates, uh, certainly has horror in his bones, and Oz Perkins made something really, really creepy and unnerving here. Um, as Haley alluded to, my recommendation is Deadpool Wolverine. Um, if you love 
or appreciated or honestly lived through nostalgia of growing up in that pre Marvel Cinematic Universe era of Marvel comic book movies from like 98 until 2008. This film has so much deeper resonance with you because it's kind of like a send off to it, um, which was really satisfying. But I could watch Ryan Reynolds' as Deadpool and Hugh Jackman as Wolverine literally do any movie because their chemistry together is just that good. And yeah. this buddy cop esque kind of banter and back and forth. Also, the action is crazy, ridiculous. All I'll say is if you watch the first scene <laughs> and you're sold, you're going to really have a good time watching this movie. If you watch that first scene and think this was stupid, you're not going to like the movie that after it. So. You might want to go. Well, no, I was going to make a reference, and I can't. I can't spoil that for people. Uh, Don't music spoil choice, any of it. The music choice in the be- opening oh, yeah. scene is just Chef's Kiss. Um, film that I off my watch list. I rewatched. So I did rewatch Argyle recently. Oh, is Argyle a great movie? No, it has a lot of problems. Is Argyle a fun movie? Yes. When's Argyle its best? When it's being absolutely ridiculous. Just like the Kingsman. So like, mm. Argyle has its moments where it goes there. And those are so delightful and fun. Um, I rewatched it for the 110th episode of Rowan in the Wasteland, which is our last episode before we have gone on a hiatus. So you can enjoy our discussion about that if you want to check that out. But Argyle is on Apple TV Plus, so it's like if you have access to that, it's there. Um, it's two hours and twenty minutes. Is it too long? Yes. Um, <laughs> are the answers to most of my questions yes? Yes. But like it still has its merits, and that's a killer soundtrack. Ariana DeBose is on two original songs for the soundtrack because acting why she's in the movie for less than five minutes. So, but her presence is felt with some banger songs. Electric Energy with her and Boy George and Niles Rogers, the bass player from Earth, Wind, and Fire. It's it's quite wonderful. I've listened to that song many times since it released on Spotify. It almost sounds like some of the things you're saying about Argyle, it, it is a good sort of like other side to like Deadpool and Wolverine because... The thing about Deadpool and Wolverine is it knows like what the fans are looking for and mm-hmm. it just goes straight for that. Mm-hmm. It, is there a lot of plot? Not really. Like not really, the, the but you don't care. Part, the, the weakest part of the movie is it does not have the most compelling structured plot to it. It's more thematic. It's more about the it's journeys a vibe. of the main characters. <laughs> Yeah. And then it just so happens to have like two roadblocks in the way. Yeah. Um, one yeah. of them's from Succession, and one of them's bald. Um, so there you go. There you Those go. are good ways of. Uh... <laughs> That's funny. so like yeah. It's it's much more of that kind of film where it's just like there's not like a structured plot. There's a MacGuffin. Well, actually, kind of Wolverine's a MacGuffin too. In the grand scheme of it but like the whole idea is like it's their it's a journey of these two characters to prove themselves and some adversity there there's some cameos there some surprising characters who have a lot more screen time than you'd probably expect them to have 100 it's, it's a crazy fun time oh but that music though too that there are some things i will be listening to I will be downloading I, and listening to later. Um, all I'm going to say is one of my biggest pet peeves is when they use a great song in the trailer and it's not in the movie. Mm-hmm. Um, they did not commit that sin No. with this movie. So if you know what song I'm talking about from the trailer, oh, it hits in the movie too. Um, and all I have to say is I'm not going to say the song, but this is kind of spoiling anyway. 
I did not know that I would ever get a Wolverine fight scene to ACDC. But <laughs> I did. And I enjoyed it a lot. Your life is better for it, Shane. <laughs> my life is better for it. My last recommendation is rewatching one of my own films of my collection. Um, I will be highlighting this on the Wasteland Retrospective for our special fifth episode of the month of August, where my brother and I are going to be talking about a couple Sylvester Stallone movies. Honestly, mm -hmm. I could have recommend, I can, actually, what I can recommend both of them. It's Rocky and First Blood. Um, what do these two films have in common? I feel like the legacy of the franchises that they're a part of have diminished the fact that these are two actually amazing films. There's so much more depth to the first Rocky movie than, mm -hmm. say, Rocky IV, which is literally 90 minutes of montages, music videos, and boxing. Like, barely anything else in the movie besides those three things but this first Rocky movie is about Rocky as a person. Mm -hmm. And it isn't even about him winning. Right. It's about him showing that he can get into that ring and compete and do something. And the cast is amazing. And both Rocky and First Blood show that like Sylvester Sloan's a legitimately good actor. Does he have a great agent who gets him all the best roles? No. No. He's taken some stinkers and the movies he should not have gone near with a 20-foot pole. But it, the heart and soul that he puts into Rocky is so special. And like Talia Shire, Burt Young, Burgess Meredith, Carl Weathers, it's an amazing cast. And First Blood has so much more depth than slow motion Sylvester Stallone shooting an arrow with a bomb on the end of it and blowing people to smithereens, like yeah. the second Rambo. Or, you know, the ill-advised one in the third Rambo 3, where they team up with the Mujahideen, and at the end of the movie that this was in honor of our friends, the Mujahideen. And I'm like, well, let's turn that clock 10 years into the future, and 9-11. You really should have known that wasn't going to age well like come on <laughs> that aged poorly but the first like first blood is a gr like a grounded intense thriller about a vietnam vet who is bullied and treated like shit by local police because they think he's just some kind of drifter who's gonna cause problems because he looks like a hippie, because he has long hair and stuff like that. And because they abuse him, things go sideways. And right. this is an intense film and has so much to say about small town politics and law enforcement and also the military mm. and what it does to people. I'm like, there's this is a rich film that has such an emotional climax to it. Especially also, for its time. Which, it's really unexpected for a film that came out, I think it was 1980. Which yeah. was only five years after the end of Vietnam. For, right. like, this to be, like, that biting about it. Right. And, like, yeah, um, Richard Crenna and Brian Dennehy, great supporting uh, turns. Brian Dennehy is, like, the prototypical shitbag sheriff um, in movies. It's just, like, he is so high on his own supply of, like, he's in charge and the mm -hmm. like the fact that like the one scene where the one scene where they have rambo take out the whole entire police station without a weapon uh <laughs> yeah. is like is like you don't mess with green berets and you don't mess with war veterans and because like that like rambo has serious ptsd which they deal with yeah. in the film uh right. i think they kind of forget about it in the next two movies that's I why like he... i was mad that there were other movies i'm like um well, well where are you gonna go with that the original i never ending, saw them. the original ending of first blood was he kills himself that's the ending to the book it's the original ending to the movie because it fits the whole ptsd right. thing us failing our troops mm-hmm 
But then they're like, shit, this is going to make a ton of money. We can't kill them if we need to make yeah. a sequel. So then they changed the ending. And I'll admit, Rambo First Blood Part 2, which is the dumbest title ever. First Blood Part 2. Rambo First Blood Part 2. Because Second title, Blood didn't sound good. <laughs> actual title is an incredible action movie. But... And it has, like, little bits of, like, actual message. I didn't like, get there. it's much more of, like, an action movie. Because it's, mm -hmm. the whole entire story of the second one is that he gets sent to reconnaissance to appease people who think we still have POWs. And he finds actual POWs, and then the government tries to cover it up. Because oh. they're, like, they had no intention of going in and actually taking those POWs back home. And Rambo's like, I'm a one-man army. I'm getting them all home. And then it turns mm. into that kind of movie. Um, but no, the Rocky and First Blood are two incredible first films and franchises whose franchises then really messed with the <laughs> formula. And then people don't take any of them seriously enough. So if you haven't rewatched Rocky or First Blood in a long time or haven't watched them before, definitely worth a watch like people are like how did rocky win best picture i'm like if you actually watch the movie it's a really good movie mm -hmm. um and sylvester stallone wrote it himself and then he is rocky he's like a hundred percent he is rocky about well 100 percent. but anyway let's wrap here on another episode of welcome to the wasteland next week i'm going to be diving into uh different kind of film from John Ford as we're taking a brief break from the world of westerns and big budget Hollywood films for a war documentary from Korea. This is Korea so my buddy Jim who was on all of my World War II documentary episodes he'll be coming back on for that episode. Um, Haley thank you so much for coming on and chatting movies with me. Absolutely thank you for always uh, pushing me out of my comfort zone. Uh, next round for our next director might not be so much out of your comfort zone because it's Wes Anderson. I know, um, I can't <laughs> freaking wait! <laughs> but neither can I. But thank all of you out there for always tuning in and supporting your Wasteland Reviewer.